For the past 60 years, the medical community has been focusing on lowering total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol while ignoring triglycerides. In today's show, we're going to talk about the importance of triglyceride reduction. This is an independent biomarker that is linked with cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis, and even sudden death. And I feel like not enough people care about their triglyceride levels or know about their levels and are unaware about which foods increase their triglycerides, yet they're scared of red meat or saturated fat for fear that it will raise their cholesterol and LDL cholesterol cholesterol, but have no problem eating the high carb, low fat foods known to increase triglyceride levels. Uh, Sam, by the way, who has been our videographer since 2015, he was just on a trip and texted me a picture last week about the bagels, the wheat thins, the pretzels, uh, the cookies and, and the cliff bars and all of the uh, high carb foods, low fat foods that people are eating, thinking that they're helping their cardiovascular risk, that they're lowering their cardiovascular risk because they're not having the saturated fat, the evil red meat and all the, all the like. But we now know that these foods that are rampant in our society, I was on a camping trip with some friends and they brought Doritos, they brought the cookies that have all the uh, cottonseed oil in them, uh, but they did not want to have any of the red meat that we, that we were bringing. They're scared of saturated fat. So, you know, it seems that these these fallacies are, are, are really, they take a long time to unlearn. And so I think it's important to harp and, and really talk about the importance of metabolic health because high triglycerides and their associated remnant cholesterol lipoproteins are linked with cardiovascular disease and specifically the consumption of processed foods. So let's take a deeper dive into what the literature shows when it comes to looking at elevated triglyceride levels, its links with cardiovascular disease, even in people who are on lipid lowering medications or therapy. This is really important. You know, many people go to the doctor, they get put on a statin because their LDL cholesterol is high, but that doesn't change their triglyceride level. And we now know from multiple studies in statin therapy groups and cohorts, various research studies we're going to dive into, show a strong association with high triglycerides in a non-fasted state and poor outcomes when it comes to cardiovascular disease, which by the way, is the number one cause of premature death in this country. So everyone should care about this. 630,000 people just in the U.S. alone die from heart disease every single year. These people are in their 40s, in their 50s, and 60s. So you should know about triglycerides and remnant cholesterol. So let's dive into this paper, which was published in the Archives of Cardiovascular Disease in 2021. The scientists say there is still substantial risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease events despite intensive statin therapy. And data from clinical trials suggest that an elevated concentration of triglycerides is a marker of residual cardiovascular risk on low-density lipoprotein therapy. So even if your doctor says, hey, Sally, your LDL cholesterol is high, we're going to put you on this medication, and ignores your triglyceride, your risk is not reduced significantly. Like, there might be a little residual risk reduction probably from the off-target effects of the and the anti-inflammatory properties offered by the statin, but you should really focus on your metabolic health because it turns out that the triglycerides and their associated remnant cholesterol particles are linked with clotting, linked with inflammation. And that's where we're really going to focus on. Another paper in 2019 titled Remnant Cholesterol and Coronary Atherosclerotic Plaque Burden Assessed by Computed Tomography Coronary Angiography. This is a big multi-syllabic jargon word for talking about a CCTA. Many people in their mid-40s and 50s are getting biannual CCTAs of the heart to look at the calcified plaque within the coronary arteries and get an objective assessment of their cardiovascular risk. The conclusion of this study in 587 participants was remnant cholesterol levels are associated with significant coronary atherosclerotic burden as assessed by CTCA, even in patients with optimal LDL cholesterol levels, which is important because you can optimize your LDL cholesterol with a you know, high carb, low fat diet with, you know, plant-based diet with all these things. But what about your triglycerides? Really important to understand that this is an independent biomarker of metabolic health. And if we haven't yet mentioned it, triglycerides are linked with high remnant cholesterol particles. So these are synonymous. And so it's important to understand that these particles are really atherogenic and they actually induce inflammation and clotting cascades in the body. So here's an image of the foods that Sam shared with me on his trip. We have Cliff Bars, we have bagels, we have Cheerios, whole wheat Cheerios that are heart healthy, right? This is so common. I, you have seen this in your family. You've seen this at your workplace. And yet these people are scared of butter. They're scared of egg yolks. They're scared of red meat, but they're eating the stuff that 
jacks up their triglycerides, their insulin resistance related biomarkers. Uh, you have a banana in the background, not that that's problematic, especially if you're exercising. You have kettle chips, uh, Frito chips, uh, the list goes on. And, and I see this all the time when I'm out in public looking at people's grocery carts and I just want to just shake them and say, if you only knew these, this research. So let's dive into this research. All right, so why do triglycerides matter? Well, the scientists say serum triglycerides are a biomarker for triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, and several lines of evidence indicate that triglyceride-rich lipoproteins and their cholesterol-enriched remnant particles are associated with atherogenesis, that is the formation of plaque and fatty streaks in your coronary vessels and throughout the body. Genetic data in humans strongly suggest that these remnants of triglycerides and the triglyceride-rich lipoproteins are a causal cardiovascular risk factor. So it goes beyond total cholesterol and LDL. And in fact, we did a video and we talked about this particular paper in 2023 titled Remnant Cholesterol Can Identify Individuals at Higher Risk of Metabolic Syndrome Than the General Population. I shared with you an equation to figure out your remnant cholesterol. Super easy. Just get your standard cholesterol measurements. You should also include, as we talk about on our blood work masterclass and in the blood work cheat sheet, ApoB and ApoA1. This is an $11 add-on. $11. You can add this on. Tell your doctor, no, don't run my lipid panel unless you also add on the ApoB to ApoA1 one really important to understand but this equation to look and ascertain your remnant cholesterol which will help you better figure out your level of your vldls and your idls and your remnant lipoproteins chylomicrons is total cholesterol minus hdl minus ldl now this level ideally should be under 10 it should be around 10 or 12 in most metabolically healthy people as you get closer to insulin resistant and you start not exercising, eating processed foods, that level is going to increase closer to 20 and that's gonna be problematic because that means that you have a lot of these triglyceride enriched lipoproteins floating around causing inflammation and worsening cardiovascular risk related biomarkers. So before we continue on friends, I just wanna say thank you for being here. If you're enjoying the content, hit that like button. I know these videos get a little complex, but we like to drill into the details and help you better understand the physiology because the mainstream perception of cardiovascular risk is so wonky. So please leave a comment. Let me know what you think on these videos. Now, since we're talking about metabolic health and ways to support metabolic health, I wanna mention the Berberine Fasting Accelerator. There's been over 216 reviews over at myoscience.com. Customers are finding this helps prevent the consumption consumption of processed food in the eating time. Most people, the, the time that they consume junk, the chips or crackers, ice cream, cake, and cookies, and that is in the evening time. The closer you eat that processed food to bed, the more likely you'll put on body fat and derail your metabolic health. So we have a lot of customers like uh, Danielle, who said, this helps decrease my cravings at night. She just left that review several days ago. James recently reviewed, we'll take this long-term because it worked. I never know how well this worked with my diet and exercise regime until people made mention that I look differently. I take it on an empty stomach first thing in the morning with no issue. So you can save by going over to myoscience.com, check out the Berberine Fasting Accelerator, use the code podcast at checkout. I will put links in the description below. You can read some of the many reviews and see what other people like you are saying. So let's continue on and talk about what is the deal with triglycerides? Why should you care, right? You probably haven't heard of this being mentioned by your doctors because it turns out that some of the drugs are not very popular, like phenofibrates and actually omega-3 fish oil has been shown to reduce triglycerides, as does lifestyle intervention. So I strongly feel, this is just anecdotal in my opinion here, that the mainstream medical profession kind of ignores triglycerides because the fix is exercise and nutrition. And doctors want to leave you with something that, that they can give you a prescription for. Bless their hearts. They're trying to help you get better. But they know that some people are just not going to do the exercise and the lifestyle change. So they give you a statin instead of encouraging you and giving you the strategies in their six to eight minute visit to change your diet and your lifestyle. But we know that lifestyle related changes in exercise and nutrition and sleep are the best ways to lower triglycerides and the, their associated increased risk for cardiovascular disease. So the scientists say plasma triglycerides are carried in chylomicrons and very low density lipoproteins known as VLDLs collectively termed triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. Although chylomicrons and VLDL particles are generally too large to cross the endothelium, triglycerides can influence several aspects of atherosclerotic lesion development, meaning they are atherogenic. Now, we have to give a huge thanks to a scientist back in the 1960s known as Pete Ahrens. This was a tribute to him. He was the first one to associate, and actually during his lectures, 
He would show the blood vials of high triglycerides on people eating a high carb, low fat diet, which was completely antithetical at that time because, you know, Ansel Keys was on the front page of Time magazine. Now, as you know, he was a big proponent of a high carb, low fat diet because that was purportedly associated with a lower level of total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol, who he's featured on Time magazine. And so back then, this is really when fat became the villain. But Pete Aron said, hey, wait, there's something more going on. And he actually created the assay to look at blood triglycerides. So we need to thank uh, him for helping us better understand this connection between high carb diets and high blood triglycerides and their association with atherosclerosis. If you want to read the book, Big Fat Surprise by Nina Teicholz, she really goes into the history on this. So Pete was the first to show that a high carb, low fat diet increased plasma triglycerides. From his studies in human subjects, he became convinced that the development of atherosclerosis and heart disease could not be fully explained by any simple dietary hypothesis, that it's multifactorial. He was infatigable in pointing out the necessity of additional clinical research in human studies to delineate individual differences in responses to diet. Unpopular as these views may have been, time has revealed the correctedness of his views. It is now recognized that factors in our lifestyle other than diet, the functioning of the endothelial cells, blood pressure, abnormalities of clotting cascades, and, and more may play prominent roles or even dominant roles in susceptibility to heart disease. In his research endeavors, Pete's identity as a physician made him an astute observer of clinical phenomenon. So he was a big factor at looking at this as a multifactorial process, not just looking at one biomarker and myopically focusing on that, looking at the whole picture. And so this is where triglycerides come in because it turns out they impact the whole picture. They impact clotting cascades, inflammatory cascades, atherosclerosis, and more. So you can see here in figure two from that article in Advances in Carvascular Medicine, triglyceride-rich lipoproteins influence atherosclerosis by promoting inflammation and adhesion, and the remnants promote endothelial dysfunction. Remember, endothelial dysfunction is linked with erectile dysfunction, is linked with poor blood flow. And this can activate the clotting cascade which enhances platelet aggregation, and patients with elevated triglycerides have increased concentrations of thrombotic factors such as fibrinogen as well as plasminogen activator inhibitor 1. So I do recommend, and this is on the blood work cheat sheet, looking at your fibrinogen levels. This is a $17 add-on at LabCorp Quest. Really good to look at as well. Okay, so let's look at the evidence here and, and the epidemiological associations between high triglycerides and risk for cardiovascular disease. What does the science say? Because all you hear about is total cholesterol, saturated fat, LDL cholesterol. Well, numerous epidemiological studies and meta-analyses have demonstrated that high concentrations of triglycerides, both in the fasted and non-fasted state, I'm gonna emphasize this more in just a moment, are associated with higher risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. In a meta-analysis involving 10,158 incident coronary heart disease cases from 262,000 participants in 29 studies find that the adjusted odds ratio for cardiovascular disease was 1.72 for individuals who have the highest level of triglycerides compared to those who have the lowest level. So you're looking at a 73% increase in incident cardiovascular disease, or, and this was a, a meta-analysis of 29 different studies. Now, two prospective observational studies, this is a Copenhagen City Heart Study as well as the Women's Health Study, really highlight the importance of non-fasted triglyceride levels. In the Copenhagen Heart Study, increased concentration of non-fasted triglycerides were associated with an increased risk of myocardial infarction, ischemic heart disease, and death in both men and women. In the Women's Health Study, involving a cohort of healthy women in the USA, non-fasted triglycerides were associated with an increased risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, whereas fasted triglycerides were not. So let's talk about the importance here. And this is why I don't have bulletproof coffee or a lot of liquid fat in, in drinks and so forth. Because what I was doing is, you know, becoming more aware of this association with an elevated postprandial or non-fasted triglyceride level and endothelial dysfunction, cardiovascular disease. I started to test my non-fasted triglyceride levels and I just so happened to have a bulletproof coffee. I was very curious. I was having these a lot in like 2016, 2017, went to the lab and normally my, my triglycerides fasted are like 47, 53, something in that ballpark, like high 40s, low 50s. My triglycerides jumped up to 217. And that puts me, as we're going to soon learn from the statin uh, groups, that puts me at increased risk for having a cardiovascular event or even have an increased uh, atherosclerosis processes going on in the body. So I strongly encourage next time you get your labs to have a higher fat meal to see what your non-fasted triglyceride levels are. It's one thing to have a really low fasted uh, triglyceride level, but if you have a high post meal level, 
that can suggest that you have some underlying metabolic dysfunction that is putting you at an increased risk for having cardiovascular disease. And that's important to recognize. So in 2009, there was the Emerging Risk Factors Collaboration Analysis Study, and this was uh, an analysis of 68 long-term prospective studies finding increased triglyceride concentrations were associated with a 37% increased risk of cardiovascular disease after adjustment for other factors. So we have a lot of evidence here including increased risk for a heart attack. Now, this is a subsequent follow-up of what I just mentioned here, the Copenhagen City Heart Study. And they also included the Copenhagen General Population Study in this particular analysis. So when these studies were combined with individuals with plasma triglyceride concentrations greater than 89 milligrams per DL, I omitted the units when I mentioned my triglycerides fasted or like 47, 53 in that ballpark. I was referring to milligrams per deciliter. Sometimes they can be characterized uh, in Canada and in the UK and Europe as millimoles per liter. So we're talking about milligrams per deciliter here. The hazard ratios for individuals, and I, most people that I've worked with who are insulin resistant, this is where they fall in, 176 to 250 milligrams per deciliter. The hazard ratio increase there is 2.8. So you're at a orders of magnitude higher probability of having a carvascular related event if your uh, triglyceride levels in the non-fasted state are over 176. And so this is important to understand that a lot of people are hovering around there. Now, if your non-fasted triglycerides get over 440 milligrams per deciliter, then you are at orders of magnitude higher uh, risk of having a carvascular related event. So this was published in The Lancet in 2014. So your non-fasted triglyceride levels should be under 150 to 170 milligrams per deciliter. Again, just want to mention that uh, it's important to understand. Most people just look at fasted levels. You know, most people are under 70. If you've been low carb, you've been exercising, but look at your non-fasted levels. And if they get over 170 milligrams per DL, they're a little bit too high. So then you need to double down on, on healthy lifestyle changes. So again, why haven't we heard more about this? Well, this is an interesting finding from the statin trials. This is a prove it trial, the 4 study. There's all sorts of different studies. In the majority of the randomized statin trials, patients with high triglycerides over 396 milligrams per DL were excluded because the scientists know that people with hypertriglyceridemia are at increased risk for having poor events. So they just excluded them from the studies altogether. So post hoc analysis of these statin trials actually reveals something quite interesting. A strong association with fasting and non-fasting triglyceride levels and poor outcomes when it comes to cardiovascular disease. This was the 4S study, the Prove-It study, the IDEAL study, the TNT study. These are all these different studies that were used to cause the FDA to approve statins, right? And looking at people. So, uh, Right off the bat, the, the researchers knew that triglycerides were linked with heart disease, and that's why they excluded people with hypertriglyceridemia. Now, in the 4S study, post hoc analysis found, found that patients with high triglycerides and lowest HDL cholesterol uh, had the highest risk of having cardiovascular events, and these were the levels weren't super high here, 159 milligrams per DL for a non-fasted triglyceride. So if your levels non-fasted are above that, you're at higher risk for having a carvascular related event. And we're going to talk about how to lower triglycerides very soon. Let's just finish this up here. On the Prove-It study, people with triglyceride concentrations greater than 150 milligrams per DL also had a higher risk of recurrent events, you know, ischemia, uh, myocardial infarction, poor carvascular outcomes. And a uh, pooled analysis in the TNT study, as well as the IDEAL trials, again, these are statin trials, showed that triglyceride concentrations greater than 150 milligrams per DL were associated with higher risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease events, even in statin-treated patients. That's the important point here. Your, you, your doctor can drive your LDL to the ground, but if you are not addressing the lifestyle factors of having high triglycerides, you might still be at increased risk for having an event. And I think that's why going back to Pete Arn's work, you know, looking at this as a multimodal, multifactorial approach, not just focusing on LDL cholesterol is the sine qua non of cardiovascular disease. There are other things going on, like we talked about. More and more studies, this is the miracle study as well as the DAL outcome studies, finding fasting triglyceride concentrations at the study entry, predicted recurrent events, ischemic events in people with coronary artery issues treated with statins. So we have a lot of good evidence to suggest that high triglycerides are independently associated with poor cardiovascular outcomes and cardiovascular disease. So this is why we need to focus on lifestyle medicine. Now, there are some drugs out there like phenofibrates that have a lot of side effects that have been used to lower triglycerides. 
a, a natural compound, actually, and this is known as a medical food now, is omega-3 fish oil. This has been used a lot. People use fish oil for pregnancy, for improving cognition, even possibly preventing allergies and atopy in children when women uh, take prenatally uh, DHA. And we're not talking about DHEA, DHA, DOCA, sahexaenoic acid. This is a long chain omega-3 fat. It turns out that this is one of the best ways to lower triglycerides. When I was working in the clinical setting with Gerard Guillory over 15 years ago, he was using fish oil all the time for hypertriglyceridemia. This was a practice that uh, put pretty much everyone on vitamin D. And if your liver enzymes or triglycerides were elevated or you had signs of insulin resistance, then you also were administered four grams a day of fish oil because it was shown that that can reduce triglycerides quite quickly. Other natural compounds, myo-inositol has been shown. This is a natural B vitamin-like compound that has been shown to support metabolic health. This may be something to consider uh, as well as possibly berberine, but it's important to recognize we can't diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease on these videos. We're just talking about supporting metabolic health in general. We know that walking after meals, compressing your feeding window, adhering to an earlier time-restricted feeding program can be helpful. Minimizing the consumption of the hyperpalatable processed foods and that's kind of my blow, my, my push here a little bit back on the plant-based push because most people that go on a plant-based diet, they actually increase their consumption of hyperpalatable processed foods. This has been characterized in medical research, not just theory. And so it's important to just eat whole real food. Focus on protein, prioritizing protein. We know that protein actually does not increase triglyceride levels in the same way that high-carb-based foods do. So these are the strategies that you have access to. When, when people start fasting, uh, doing time-restricted feeding, exercising, and eating less processed foods, their triglycerides drop like a rock. It's really responsive to lifestyle changes and, and lifestyle-based therapy. So I think that's why we should have these conversations, moving away from just looking at total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol, looking at your remnant lipoproteins like we talked about. Again, that equation, total cholesterol minus HDL minus LDL, that number should be less than 10. Um, and especially if you do it fasted or non fast it doesn't impact that much. And, and your non fasted triglyceride level should be under 170 milligrams per DL. So hopefully you found these articles helpful. Hopefully you found this video and podcast helpful. I will put the links that we talked about in the description below. As always, my friends, I appreciate you tuning all the way to the very end. Thanks for hitting that like button and sharing this video with someone who is still eating the whole wheat cereal, bread, and bagels because we know that stuff will actually jack up your triglyceride levels and that is not good, my friends. So we will catch you on a future episode down the road.